I'm Juliette Coates and I work in the School of Biosciences at the University of Birmingham. Uh, this is my lab that we're in at the moment. Um, I guess it looks much like any other modern research lab, even though we work on plants and a lot of the labs that you'll, you'll see are probably medical research labs. Um, because we're interested in molecules and cells, we really use the same equipment that the medical research people do. So what we do isn't that different. And this is something that's become possible in the last couple of decades, I suppose. Plant molecular research has really taken off. And so now we can use a lot of techniques that were developed to study microorganisms, to study humans and other animals. We can use these molecular techniques now in plants. And this is why there's a, a bit of a revival, I suppose, in, in plant, plant studies, plant science. The overall big interest in my lab, I suppose, is understanding how plants evolved from teeny tiny little green cells about 1.6 billion years ago. So we're interested, if you think about all the plants that you see around nowadays, you have trees, you have things with flowers, you have mosses, you have crop plants, all these sort of, this huge diversity of plants. We want to know what are the molecular and cellular mechanisms that created that diversity? How has this happened? The main focus of research in my lab at the moment is on land plants, but particularly plants that evolved very close to that 500 million year boundary. Um, because much more is known about land plants at the molecular level, people have sequenced the genomes of land plants and they've, they've really had a look to study at the cellular level how these plants become complex, how do they do what they do, how do they flower, how do they make roots, this sort of thing. Um, but there are other types of complex green things as well, and those are the algae, which are, is an area that people really haven't looked at at all. What I think my theory is that you have plants that are complex, plants on land are complex, and you have algae in the sea, which are also highly complex, but as I say, not very well studied. And my, my hypothesis actually is that there is a common molecular toolkit that makes both these groups of green things complex. And I think if we can understand what that common molecular toolkit is, then we're in a position to be able to manipulate both plants and algae for practical reasons. So for example, nowadays, although it's controversial in the UK, um, there's a lot of research going into genetic modification of crop plants. Can we make plants that are better adapted to life in a changing climate, this sort of thing? Um, I think in this country people tend to, or in Europe, Europe generally, people tend to ignore algae, but algae are a huge potential untapped resource because, for example, they grow in the sea, so they're not taking up space on the land. There are a huge amount of biomass, and so there's a big potential there for using them for biofuels, for example. Um, in terms of food, obviously, in Asia, then people already use algae. Just think of things like sushi, for example. But also, for a long time, people have been um, trying to understand at the chemical level what makes up algae because they extract compounds out of them that can be used for therapeutic benefits so medicines antibacterials anti-inflammatories that sort of thing in terms of understanding plant evolution particularly i think for example mosses have evolved to be very tolerant to drought obviously in the early days when plants were moving on to land suddenly they're not in water anymore so uh, how are we going to reproduce how are we going to stop ourselves drying out? How do the cells actually cope with this? And so quite a lot of people who work on moss do work on drought tolerance mechanisms. And it is really thought that the molecular mechanisms that are at work in moss are conserved in higher plants. So higher plants have the same molecules, the same proteins, the same kind of communication between cells to tell them when they're under drought stress. Okay, on the left is, is what I showed you before, that's, that's our little moss, Fisca mitrella. Um, next to it, its friend is actually an even more early evolving plant. This is, a, this is a liverwort, and we really do think that these were the first kind of plants that appeared on land. Here we've got, before we saw clumps of moss, now these are individual moss plants that have kind of been again spread out on an agar, pl agar plate almost like you'd work with a microorganism and you can see them starting to sprout uh, individually. Um, you can almost get them to form a nice nice green lawn of stuff. 
Um, here we've got some more of the liverwort so I was showing you earlier on, back in situ. And I think what, what my technician is trying to do with these ones is actually get them to reproduce because liverworts come in, liverworts come in male and female varieties and so they're a little more difficult to propagate. Um, you can also get them to propagate literally just by ripping a bit of the leaf off and sticking it back in the agar and it will form a new plant. So that's all quite good fun. So the plant on the right, which probably does look a little bit more like the kind of plants that you're used to seeing from day to day, this is Selaginella, and this plant is a is a lycophyte. So it's sort of it's a little bit more advanced than moss What's and like it works. A lycophyte is they're sometimes known as spike mosses. Again, they tend to grow in fairly dark, damp places, I think, but they are also drought tolerant. So these guys evolved after mosses and liverworts but again before more complex flowering plants and seed plants so again they're in a sort of evolutionary transition on the way on the way to flowering plants that we're more familiar with if we can understand how plants undergo the process of making new roots making roots branch making roots go in different directions then again we can work out how we can breed or engineer plants that have better root systems that are adapted to particular soils. I mean, we work in a model plant so that we can understand the molecular nitty gritty, but data that comes out of this research in this little weed that we work on um, can then be taken and used by people who grow crops like rice, for example, like beans, all sorts of different things, and they say, okay, so that gene is important in the little weed, let's see if it's important in rice or beans as well, and they can make plants, for example, with bigger root systems or root systems that can go deeper, or root systems that are more tolerant to salt stress, for example. When we plant the plants over here, you can see they're very, very tiny, and eventually they start to grow, they're all labelled so we know what they are, um, they get bigger and bigger and eventually you can see here when they're making lots of flowers we start to put them in bags and this is to collect the seed so again there's no risk of the seed escaping and we know that all the seed in one bag has come from one individual plant so we have to be quite careful about things like that. What else do you want to know? Let's not subject Erica to <laughs> any kind of torture. Here actually we have got some other kinds of plants growing. These are much more like the kind of plants that you're probably familiar with. This is the little weed that we work on, Arabidopsis, which has leaves and it has roots. And so, for example, this plate is part of a, an assay that we do when we're actually trying to measure the lengths of the roots that grow and we, we measure how many branches they've got. So we're looking at the, the density of roots and we do lots of these kind of assays because we're asking how does the environment change this, this root behaviour if we manipulate genes within the plant, how does, how does that affect the behaviour of the roots as well?